It's the Rink Live podcast for a uh, snowy Thursday afternoon. We've got snow, we've got blowing snow. It's uh, about 20 degrees, so it's a typical spring day here in the state of hockey. Uh, I'm Jess Myers, joined by Mick Hatton. Uh, we want to say a big thank you to our sponsor, NCHC TV. Mick, uh, how are things in the Granite City? You shoveling at all? Anything like that going on? Yeah, we don't, we don't have quite that much snow, but uh, it, boy, it, it kind of is coming and going where you, you go out and uh, all of a sudden it kind of gushes down on you and the wind's blowing yeah my son is trying to start uh you know junior high uh, baseball practice and that's not going very well good times good times well i've spent enough uh winter weekends in south bend indiana that i know a little thing about lake effect snow now because uh south bend is right there on the southern tip of lake michigan and they they get uh, some snow blowing in there pretty quickly happy to be joined by the head coach of the notre dame fighting irish jeff jackson jeff uh, uh do you have actual spring in indiana now or, or are you still dealing with this stuff i think we're all accustomed to uh you can call it sprinkle i suppose uh you know, it's just like now it's probably gale force winds outside. It's not snowing here, but it's windy. And uh, you, you never know what you're going to get from day to day, tornadoes or wind or snow or rain. Uh, but that's one of the great things about living in the Midwest, which I've done <laughs> my entire life. True, true story, actually. The first time I went to a game at Notre Dame, it was back at the old building. Uh, before Compton Family Ice Arena was built. You were playing Denver. It was a Thursday night game, and there was a tornado warning during the game. I remember they abandoned the uh, the Zambonis out in the middle of the ice. It looked like one of those post-apocalyptic scenes from a movie, but then uh, you, you resume the game and you beat Denver, and it was uh, it was a good game. I got to know Notre Dame hockey a little bit. A lot of fun. Uh, behind you, by the way, Compton Family Ice Arena, If I uh, there's a certain fan base that I can get them uh, kind of under their skin because I say ND has the best rink in college hockey, and I don't mean North Dakota, and uh, that, that's kind of a fun way to get them going. I just They did it right when they built Compton. Just, a, a, I think, a perfect college hockey facility. You must uh, love working there. Yeah, we we're very fortunate. Uh, you know, I, I give a lot of credit, you know, to both the two athletic directors that I've worked for. Initially, um, you know, we were going to renovate the Joyce Center. And then when Jack Swarbrick came in, uh, we had already raised like $20 million. And when he came in, he said, listen, he said, we need to build a new facility. Uh, and, you know, and he followed through on that. It took a couple extra years, but you know, in the long run, it was well worth it just in the fact that, you know, you're right, we have a, a tremendous facility and, you know, I, I, I can't say enough about the Compton family, um, you know, the previous owners of the San Jose Sharks, their son went to school here and a huge hockey guy and, and him and his wife were, you know, huge to our program and, and helping us build this facility. Mick, Mick's hey, on I mute. Need, Hang on. There he goes. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, I needed to unmute myself. I'm uh, battling a little bit of a cold, so I'm trying not to uh, cough over anybody's uh, with anybody saying. So I apologize. Uh, but uh, Jeff, uh, you know, let's just talk a little bit about uh, you know the, this past season for you guys. Obviously, you know you, you come up one goal short of uh, you know making the making it to the Frozen Four. Uh, j just, uh, you know, overall, I guess, uh, you know, how would you assess, I guess, the season for you guys? Because on the outside, it sure looks like it was a big success for you guys. I was really pleased with our year. Um, you know, we, we, had, we had some really great moments. Uh, you, know, we were, you know, we were within reach of the Big Ten title, um, you know, and then obviously it's always our objective to, to make the NCAA tournament and you know, we want to consistently be a top 10 program and, you know, it, 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 it's challenging sometimes, you know, we, we really, you know, we try to bring in, you know, game breaker type players. It doesn't always work for us, but, you know, we, we have a lot of really good players and guys that, uh, that get better over time. And, you know, we're proud of that. I mean, this year was another example of that. You know, we, we probably got as many free agent guys signing professionally as anybody. And, you know, I think that's due to the, the quality of the, the, the development process over their three, four years. And, you know, I think this year was another indication of guys getting better, guys taking a big step, especially a few of our sophomores, rising juniors, and, and a few of our rising seniors, our junior class. So if it wasn't for guys like that, um, you know, then maybe you don't have the kind of year that we have. And, and uh, you know, I thought that the grad transfers brought a different element to our team. Uh, they, they, you know, they were great kids. They, they made our guys realize how good they have it here. Um, when they came in, that was the biggest thing that they probably established with our culture is, 
you know, telling our guys, hey, you, you have no idea how good you have it here, you know, coming from different programs and different environments. And our culture was extremely strong. So, you know, the, the only disappointment is we didn't get to the Frozen Four. I thought that we had a team that might be capable of that. Um, our, our offense, I mean, we were top 10 offense in the first half of the year, kind of dried up in the second half. Guys that had really good first half, some guys uh, struggled in the second half for different reasons. You know, Max Ellis, not many people know he was pretty dinged up for the whole second half. He had a constant problem going on with his ankle and other guys uh, sick and injured. Uh, it was, I mean, at the end of the year, our trainer gave me his, you know, before we start getting back into training and a list of guys that were dinged up and probably couldn't practice or, or we weren't going to practice anyways, but lift. And uh, the, the list was about 18 long. So guys with different types of injuries, which, which is not uncommon with most programs, especially teams that, you know, go that long into the season. We, uh, you mentioned recruiting and you mentioned that, you know, the kind of player that you bring to Notre Dame, talking to guys like Mel Pearson and, and Steve Rollick and others who are at these schools that have high pro profile football programs. You know, there, there's not a kid in America that hasn't seen uh, the, the interlocking ND on TV at, at some point in, in their life on a Saturday afternoon. I would think that's got to be a big advantage. And yet at the same time, you know, do people find Notre Dame and its kind of academic atmosphere as one of the, the truly great schools in America? Is that intimidating to some kids? How do you balance that challenge of the, of the high visibility and yet the, uh, you know, I guess the, the reputation that Notre Dame has as well? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, when I first got here, um, you know, you, you always have people negatively recruiting you for whatever reason. Uh, maybe you have too many players, maybe, uh, you know, maybe like when I first got here it was about the Joyce Center, we didn't have facilities. Uh, then it went from that, it went to the education being too hard. You want to be a hockey, I mean, one, one coach told one of our recruits, do you want to be a hockey player or you want to be a student? And like, for me, like, I mean, parents would never say that, you know, but the thing is like, you know, kids, they want to be, they, if they want to be hockey players, you know, it's no different. I mean, there's a lot of quality education going on in the Big Ten. And like for us, like we have a great education here, but um, you can do both. You know, your day's 24 hours long and like you, you've got about three, four hours a day in classes and you got about three hours at the rink. And like you have to be the best in both environments. And like our kids are rock stars in the classroom. We have a number of guys in the dean's list. Um, we got, you know, our team averages over a three, four great, great point average almost every semester. Um, we've got good students here, but they're also good hockey players and you can do both. Um, so there's always, you know, that challenge. Uh, uh, but I, I don't think, you know, I actually think uh, the one advantage we have with that in mind is that we only have 8,500 students here. So like you're in class sizes of about, some of our class sizes are like 10, you know, I mean, guys are in, you know, the average class, the class professor ratio is like 10 to one. So like our, our guys, you know, on a positive side, get a lot of help from professors. They get a lot of attention. Um, now, mind you, they're sitting next to valedictorians in their class. But, you know, I think that, uh, you know, for me, I think that anytime you're surrounded by, you know, high achievers, whether it's in the classroom in the weight room or on the ice, it makes you better. And that's kind of the, the selling point that we try to make to kids that that get sold that message that the school is too hard. Uh, you, you've coached for for a long time, Jeff. Uh, you're also obviously you are the head coach at Lake Superior State. Uh, just describe, I guess, what what these last two seasons have been like uh, in, in trying to deal with the transfer portal. We were kind of talking about this a little bit before we got we got started, but uh, how how wild and and uh, how, how weird, I guess, is it uh, to, to deal with as a head coach? It is challenging. I mean. Uh... Uh, this year we were much better prepared for it than we were last year. And, you know, it's not so much about, you know, trying to recruit kids that have been playing in another program for four years, as much as it is, you know, your own guys. I mean, guys that are seniors, like you, you really don't know. There's the, the few exceptions that you know that are going to get, you know, one way NHL deal or they're going to get the high end NHL deal. Uh, but then there's the guys that may not, you know, that may be, getting offers in the American league or two way deals in the American league. And, you know, what's the best solution? Is it better to play a fifth year? Is it, you know, is it better to go play in the American league? And, you know, it, it, you try to be honest with your guys. I mean, 
but no matter what you tell them, I mean, they're going to always look at you, you know, as what's in our best interest as opposed to theirs. Uh, I try not to do that. I try to separate that as much as possible, but you know, it, it, that's the, the challenging part is about your own guys coming back for a fifth year. And then once that decision is made, you know, you're back in the recruiting process, the season ends and you're recruiting full, full force, uh, probably more so than you do any time uh, during the year with, with uh, true freshmen. And it's, you know, I'm not sure that it was meant to be this way. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not a fan of the transfer rule overall. Um, you know, and I, and I, you know, I came from Lake Superior State. So like for me, you know, the schools like Lake Superior State, you know, if a kid all of a sudden thinks that he's better than the school, he's just going to transfer. The other thing I'm concerned about is kids bailing out because, you know, maybe they weren't on the first line in their freshman year. Um, you know, I, I, I use Max Ellis as an example. I think Max Ellis could have transferred if that rule had been in place after his freshman year. I think he only played a half a dozen games. And like, if that rule had been in place, he might have transferred, but then in, then he didn't have to fight through everything he had to fight through to get where he was this past year. And that to me is, you know, in a, in a society of, that we're surrounded by entitlement, the transfer rule plays right into that. And I'm not a big fan of it. And there's nothing we can do about it. It's here to stay. And, you know, the grad transfer thing is, is, is make, making it a much bigger deal than it'll probably be in about three or four years, but because of the COVID year. Uh, everything will settle down a little bit more in probably two years, but you know, in the meantime, we're we're trying to deal with it. And we're also trying to take advantage of it. I'll be very honest with you, Jeff. In the middle of uh, transfer portal stuff and signings and everything else going on this week, uh, kind of quietly, Jerry York, after 50 years, announces he's stepping away from college hockey. You know, one one of those things that I guess none of us ever thought would happen. Maybe uh, you know, you you've known Jerry very well. You've coached against him in a national championship game. You coached against him in hockey East for a while. You know, everything I've heard about Jerry and in my interaction with Jerry, one of the, just the true gentlemen in college hockey, but I wanted to get your thoughts on, on him and on his career and, and kind of your interactions with him over the years. Well, it actually started uh, way back uh, when I was at Lake Superior State as an assistant and he was the head coach at Bowling Green. And, uh, you know, I got to know Jerry a bit back then. Uh, obviously when he went out East, we didn't have as much contact, but, when I came back to Notre Dame, I mean, one of the annual games is against Boston College. I mean, we have the uh, Holy War on ice, they call it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I developed a close relationship with him. I mean, we, we have a common uh, health issue with our eyes and we shared a lot of information. I actually, he actually set me up to see one of his eye specialists in Boston. Um, and like the, the guy is like, He's the epitome of what you would like to have. I'm sure if, if I was, if my son was playing college hockey uh, to play for a guy like that and, yep. you know, relish the days that we had when, you know, when Ron Mason, Red Berenson, Jackie Parker, I mean, you know, I'm getting up there. I'm not quite with them yet, but like <laughs> the, the true, I mean, the game is changing. We be, we're becoming a lot more corporate. Um, it's becoming a lot more cutthroat and, you know, the recruiting process has, you know, become a nightmare. Um, you know, for me, I think that, uh, you know, guys like him or, you know, I, I think that's the way it was meant to be. I mean, he is without question one of the classiest guys I've ever met. Um, and, and you can always tell when somebody's not who they really appear to be. And like, that's not Jerry's case. Like he is the real deal. Um, he's honorable and I know he's one of the most positive of everybody I've spoken to that has played for him because I coached a number of his kids when I was the national coach and you know the, the, the guy is just unreal positive uh, and you know it's you know and I, I plan on sitting down and talking to him a little bit about the decision when he retired I mean that decision is going to be coming to me probably sooner than later um, you know it, it's always a, for me like a and I'm sure the say he feels the same way as it's a, it's a really tough thing to give up. It's, I imagine it's like being an alcoholic or a smoker, you know, it's just like yeah, coaching becomes addictive. I mean, <laughs> part of who you are and like how you give that up and what you're going to do with all that additional time. You know, it's a, it's a little bit, I've, I've thought about it more in recent years, but it's a little bit scary. And, uh, 
you know, I mean, he, he's got grandkids and he's got, you know, his family. And, you know, I think that um, knowing Jerry is that he'll still be around the game a lot. And, uh, but, you know, he's a great man and, you know, he, he's done an awful lot for not just Boston College, but, you know, college hockey in general. Uh, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, coaching for the, you know, co coaching for the national team. Uh, you, you spent time uh, coaching uh, for the national development program. Uh, you, you've coached, uh, you know, national teams, uh, you know, for, for the, you know, Team USA over the years. What, when you think back, uh, you know, to, to your experiences uh, with, with that, uh, what, what, what sticks out, I guess, uh, for you, Jeff, about those experiences? Um, you know, there's a number of different things. I mean, like I never really expected to leave college hockey when I was at Lake Superior State. Um, I was, I loved college hockey. Uh, when USA Hockey came calling to ask me to be the national coach for USA Hockey, I listened. Um, you know, they, the, the, the opportunity to coach the, the senior national team, uh, the national junior team every year, and then be an assistant with the U.S. Olympic team. Uh, and then my my day to day job was to come up with a system to develop the top young players in the in the in the United States. And, you know, it, it was really my idea to to put a national team program together. Uh, and we, we decided to put it in Michigan because it was central to competition at that time. Uh, but the, the, the idea behind it was to develop the top young American players and my long term and I was in the process of doing it when I left there, but my long term goal was to impact more than just the, the 50 kids that were in the national program. I wanted to create a national team development league and we were in the process when I left of, of taking over the USHL and uh, because of all the politics and because of all the, the, the crazy craziness out there for self interest. Uh, that was part of the reason I left. It was just, uh, it was too much stress on my life. Um, and as well, and Bob Mancini was with me during that time and Scott Monaghan still there, but, you know, it was really a great opportunity to learn about the game. Uh, it was a great learning experience internationally. Um, it was, it was great to, to be able to coach, you know, young players that had a lot of talent. I mean, those teams were probably the most talented teams I'll ever coach. The only difference is, is they, they were 16 and 17 years old. So <laughs> it brought on a whole different <laughs> in the early years. And we had, a, in fact, I just got a funny that you mentioned is I just got a text uh, from a, a gopher alum. Um, uh, he was on his way to Cleveland with his son, Jordan Leopold. Oh, nice. He, he wanted to stop by. He actually stopped by my office and I just so happened to be out. Uh, but um, he was on the very first team, the 1980 birthday, uh, when we started. And I thanked him for his, uh, you know, I mean, it was a leap of for those kids that when we started that program to, you know, a, a brand new program, you know, especially coming from Minnesota, which is, you know, one of the greatest development uh, states in the country, you know. So it, it was a unique experience and gave me an opportunity to, to, to meet and coach kids from all across the country and, and very elite, elite, elite players as well. So for people who don't know, a little, little Notre Dame hockey history. The program was started by Lefty Smith, who was uh, from South St. Paul, Minnesota, kind of a legendary coach there in the 70s in the old WCHA. For much of the 80s, Notre Dame hockey was a club program, did very well at the club level, and then they, the school decided to kind of reinstate it to the, to the varsity level in 1989. I remember that first year that Notre Dame hockey was kind of making its comeback. Notre Dame football was in the midst of the, the Lou Holtz era then, you know, a lot of, a lot of hype about the, about the Irish. And I remember asking Rick Schaefer, how often do you interact with Lou Holtz? And he said, well, I see him on TV every Saturday. But uh, uh, with that in mind, you know, the fact that Notre Dame football is such a big deal. One of the cooler things I saw this season, a, a Notre Dame gopher game on a Saturday night, kind of a buzz in the crowd. And John Finner and my friend from South Bend points out to me, down in the corner of the rink is Marcus Freeman, the, the new coach of the Irish football program. He's got a bunch of recruits there checking out Notre Dame hockey. I just wonder how much interaction is there like that? And is taking kids to a Notre Dame football game part? Part of your uh, kind of recruiting pitch to show them what what Notre Dame is all about. Yeah, we we have a tendency. I mean, we, we the one the one unique thing about this place is, and I think it goes back to what I was talking about earlier. Only being eighty five hundred students, 
is like the, the relationship between the coaches is extremely good. Like when I went to, I went to Michigan state. So, you know, back then, I'm not going to speak on, on, on now, but back then we were definitely second class citizens and uh, as hockey players. And like, ever since I've been here, I've never felt that. Like I was a grad assistant at the university of Michigan too, back when they were in the old WCHA and like, you know, even there, you felt like a second-class citizen to football. You know, since I've been here, I've never had that feeling. I've never felt from a, a program perspective, a resource perspective, um, obviously facilities now. I mean, um, everybody here gets treated very well. And, you know, it's it, it, the focus here is on developing the total person. Um, as an athlete, I mean, we're, you know, we're expected to encourage our guys to be involved in service. Our guys are expected to be good students. Um, I love the environment here. I was meant to be here. I mean, yep. if I had, you know, a long time ago, I wish I would have had the opportunity to come here because I feel like I belong here. You know, it's just who I am. And uh, it's about the development of people as much as it is about the development of hockey players. And, and uh, yeah, I, I love that, that relationship that I, I've had relationships varying relationships with the football coaches, but, uh, Marcus, you know, I think he's a rock star. Yeah. Uh, this guy, I mean, I just saw him yesterday. He was at the head coaches meeting. We've had, you know, we have a, a monthly head coaches meeting with our athletic director and, uh, the sports administrators and that. And like, I, I you know, in my 17 years here, um, we've had these head coaches meetings and like, I never see the football coach and we've had three already this past year where Marcus has been there. And that's like, that tells me something right from the get go. He feels part of the family, uh, the Notre Dame culture, um, you know, and it's like, it, it is unique and it is fun. I uh, got a text this morning, uh, Mike Bray, our basketball coach asked if I knew anybody down in Tampa because he wanted to take his son to a, a hockey game. And, you know, I just so happen to have a relationship with the head coach there and the assistant coach. So, you know, I got him tickets for the hockey game on Saturday night, but that's the kind of relationship we have. And we use them, utilize them occasionally in the recruiting process um, if we think it's, if, if there's a benefit to it. Um, but, you know, I, I love the environment within our, and we've had some great coaches here too. I mean, a number of them have retired in recent years, but, you know, the, some of the coaches we've had here, I think will be friends for life. I've told, uh, I've told Don Lucia this story, you know, Don's obviously a, a Notre Dame grad and, and a proud uh, Irish hockey dad, you know, all these years later, you know, his son played for you. I told Don this, I, I said, growing up in Minnesota, all I knew about Notre Dame is that they took Lou Holtz away from the Gophers. You know, they, we, you know, everybody, there was a segment in Minnesota that hated the, the Irish because, because they took Lou Holtz away. And I, I used to say, okay, it's this little Catholic college in the middle of the Indiana farmland. What's the big deal? Well, that weekend I went there and, and the, the tornado warning weekend before we went to the hockey game, it was a, a, a beautiful, Thursday night in October, you know, warm out. And a friend of mine who's a prof there took us around campus and, you know, guys are out playing football on the quad and he took us to the grotto and he showed us the golden dome. And I called Don Wichia the next day. I said, okay, now I get it. This is a pretty cool place. I mean, it really is, you know, one of, one of the really stunning college campuses in the country. Yeah, there's no question about it. And, you know, there's a feeling on this campus. There's just a feeling in the environment here. You know, maybe it's because it's a Catholic school but like the way people are treated here, um, whether they're visitors or whether they're employees or, you know, anybody in general is, is treated like a, a king here. Yeah. You know? And probably first and foremost is the students and uh, the student athletes as well. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's a unique environment. And like I said, I mean, I, I, when I came here, I fell in love with this place way back when I was a high school student coming here for a debate tournament of all things. Um, I'm still debating nowadays, but in a different, but uh, I fell in love with this place back then. And like, I, I, when this job opened up, I was with the Islanders at the time. And that year was an NHL lockout. It was the first lockout that lasted the entire season. Oof. And, uh, you know, when the job opened up, the lockout was still going on. And when Dave Poulin decided to, to, to leave, I mean, uh, I had, I had my former, uh, equipment manager at Lake State he played he's my third string goalie at Lake State just so happened to be Dave's equipment manager here so like I knew about Dave leaving before anybody and like Dave Gilbert our, our equipment manager now he's kind of oversees the arena but uh, he was probably my biggest biggest advocate within the athletic administration 
with his time with me at Lake State. So I, I had an inside edge with everybody except for maybe Don Luke. <laughs> Thanks. I you you bring up the Islanders and and, and you know and, and looking through I you also you also coached major junior for a few seasons with, with, with Guelph. Uh, what uh, just talk a little bit about the, those two experiences. Uh, you know I, I don't think a lot of I think you're so ingrained in the college hockey world that I don't think a lot of people realize that that you also have those experiences. What what were those uh, those years like for you? You know, I mean, I, I tell people I don't regret any decision I made as far as my coaching career goes. I got fired once, and that was in the OHL, but I also coached in the Memorial Cup, and I love my experience um, in, in the Ontario Hockey League. I mean, from my perspective, I i had been in college hockey, you know, Lake State as an assistant and then as a head coach for 10 years, and then I went to USA Hockey for, I was there for six years, and um, I had a lot of the stress that I, that I, I had, I mean, I had a lot of stress with the U S program, uh, just with outside people fighting against it. And, and, um, you know, when I left there, my mother had just passed away and, you know, that, that was part of the reason I, you know, that I took the job also in Ann Arbor because she lived on the East side of Detroit. So, you know, she was getting up there in age and gave me a chance to make sure that, you know, somebody was watching over her. And when she passed away, I said, you know, I, at that time, when I left the national team, um, Sean Walsh reached out to me and asked me to come and be his assistant coach. And I knew what he was asking me to do because he wanted me to take over for him when he passed because he was, he knew he was passing when he was dying. And, and I had just gone through like six months of my mom after a stroke, you know, dying. And I, I just didn't want to do that. So the easiest way for me to get away from it all was to go up to Canada um, I worked for a great organization that was owned by a high school principal, the owner of the team and the GM there, Al, Al Miller was, you know, believed in education as well. Cause our kids actually, you know, went to high school and they had to take college classes if they were post-grads. And so it was a good fit for me. And it was a great coaching experience because I didn't have to deal with all the minutia. I just got to coach. I didn't have to worry about anything but coaching. I, I did watch over the kids and their schoolwork and that, but that was just a natural tendency. And, and I, I enjoyed my experience there. Now, would I have my kids play there? Probably not. Um, just because it, you know, they like to use the terminology best of both worlds. The only thing is, is that there's a third world out there and that's the life experience away from the rink and away from the classroom. And that's the one thing that I think, you know, especially here at Notre Dame, the student life experience is probably the number one thing that I can sell as far as a young person coming here. It's just the life experience of being here and, you know, the, the, the overall experience of being a student athlete. And I was meant to be at college hockey, but I did enjoy my time in, in Guelph. And I, you know, and I was fortunate when I did get fired that I, a lot of the people that I helped along the way and, uh, Guys like Greg Cronin, who worked with me in the national team, was working with the Islanders at the time, and and Mike Milbury, um, he was my he was the GM of two of my world championship teams. So relationships allowed me to you know scout for them. Uh, after I got fired in Guelph, I scouted for the Islanders for the rest of that year, and uh, then I got hired that following season as an assistant coach, and I love that too, just being behind the bench and my first game watching Mario Lemieux skate by me. Uh, that's when I, I realized that, you know, I'm glad I did it. And it gave me a unique, a, a unique uh, uh, opportunity to really understand the game from every level that I had been in. We're talking with Jeff Jackson, the head coach at Notre Dame, and we could talk hockey for hours. I know we could, Jeff. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up, let you go pretty quickly here. But one last question, Michael Graham, you know, it, it, he lived the dream of any Minnesota kid that doesn't play college hockey in Minnesota. His, his dream as a freshman, he got to score the overtime winner against the Gophers in a playoff game, you know, had a really promising career, a kid out of Eden Prairie, just a, a fantastic kid who had a great high school career and when things were looking up, then he ran into injury problems and you, you were good enough to make kind of the smooth transition for him from the playing side to the coaching side. I know he worked with you as an assistant coach this year. Tell us about Michael and, and kind of what he's gone through in his time at Notre Dame and, and how he's kind of fit in on the other side of things now. You know, he's a, he's a great, first of all, he's a great kid, comes from a great family. 
you know, when we recruited him here, I really believed like, you know, if he hadn't run into the concussion issues, like I thought, you know, he had a little bit of a chance maybe to play in the National Hockey League because he had he had size, he had skating ability, he had the puck skills, he had the hockey sense, you know, and like the the one thing that held him back was probably because of all the concussions is that, you know, it, it was it was hard for him to be in that competitive situation you know, winning battles and things like that. And as more concussions took place, you know, I, I, you know, it got to the point where we had to get him to specialists and that. And, you know, I, I, I was, at, you know, from a, always from a legal perspective, you're asked, you're asked to stay out of this stuff, but sure. as a human being, like I, I reached out to his, his dad, his parents. Um, I, I didn't want to lose Michael as a player. I mean, he was a, he was a high end forward for us, you know, and, but I, I legitimately, you know, I watched what happened to a few guys that I've had over the years that had concussion problems. And, you know, Steven John's now being the, the poster boy for, for concussions in hockey, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, we had a serious conversation and, you know, I told Michael, I said, listen, I said, you'll still be part of the program. You know, we'll make you an assistant coach. Uh, you'll be with the boys all the time. You're still living with them. You're still hanging out with them. They're still your classmate, you know, and, and uh, you know, and I think he made, I did, you know, he made the decision on his own, but I put him in touch with Eric Ringel, who, who retired here with concussions, same identical situation. I put him in touch with Stephen Johns. You know, I, I, I wanted to make sure that he was fully educated, not just about his hockey career, but also about his life after hockey. And, uh, and I, he made the mature decision to, to retire from the game. And like, he's a great kid. It was kind of fun seeing him in a different uh, perspective. He used to hang out in the coach's office during games. And I, I, my own one rule with him, as I said, you don't share information with me that I don't need to know about your teammates. <laughs> I don't, sh- and you don't share information with your teammates, what they don't need to know about us. So, I mean, and I think he lived up to that pretty well, but. Uh, got a bright future. He got accepted into the the graduate school here. He's going to go to grad school here next year and nice. real bright future ahead of him uh, in the real world. Good for him. Well, uh, and, and when the last time I saw Michael, I, I joked with him that Lee Smith, the longtime coach at Eden Prairie is stepping down. So if he wants to move into, you know, the rat race that is Minnesota high school hockey, you can, you can maybe go back to his alma mater too. <laughs> Hard enough hockey guy. That's for sure. Yeah, good stuff. Well, like I said, we could go on forever, but this has been a, a fantastic conversation. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Jeff. Uh, Jeff Jackson, the head coach at Notre Dame. We really uh, enjoyed uh, you joining us on the Rink Live podcast today. Yes. All right. That will wrap it up for another week. That's Mick Hatton. I'm Jess Myers. This has been the Rink Live podcast. Thank you to our sponsor, NCHC TV, and we will see you at the rink. <laughs>